my great pleasure to uh, invite Kapil Sachdeva and uh, Krishna Sh uh, Shirabdi from uh, Jamalto to talk about smart cards and the web and some very interesting things that they are talking about, you know, where they meet. Um, my name is Rajat Mukherjee and I'm a PM on search. Uh, it's really good to have them uh, all here today. So let's just get started and uh, keep our questions um, to the end mostly, but if, you if something pops up, feel free to interrupt. Keep this as an interactive as possible. All yours. Thanks, Rajat. So today, actually, I'm going to take you on a brief journey in the world of smart cards. I'll talk about basics, what smart cards are, what is the infrastructure they fit in, and what are the applications and their corresponding software stacks which utilize the security of smart card. And finally, at the end, we will see that how all of this scales if you want to provide the security of smart cards to the web. So starting with the basics, first, the hardware device itself. The way I, I like to see smart cards are that they are, they are computers. They have all the elements of computers, but they don't have the, the keyboard or the mouse, the, the human in interface, device interface. But they do have CPUs. Volatile memory, RAM, non-volatile memory where we put our applications, data, and read-only memory which contains the operating system that, is, that goes in the smart cards. There is a very domain-specific term called integrated circuit card. So smart card is also known as ICC, which means that you have an I.O. line on which you put the data, and that's how smart card software gets the data to process on. Moving on to the security device itself. First and foremost, it's a temper resistant device, which means that if you try to attack the hardware itself, it has some inbuilt mechanisms in it such that it either shut, it, shut itself down or provide a way to recover from it and, and counter attack the attacker itself. It also has a lot of cryptographic implementation. Most of the algorithms that are out there are implemented in the cards, in software. And sometimes, even the chip manufacturer provide a very sophisticated, secure algorithm implementation. And another interesting thing that we do in our industry is that when we make a product or when we launch a technology, smart card based technology, we try to in evaluate it internally, as well as we send it to some evaluation labs and compliance with some industry standards. So FIPS is a federal standard uh, from uh, United States government. And common criteria is an international standard which, which basically states how the process, how the development process of this product should be. It should be in a secure location. Source configuration management should be this way. And how the security algorithms should be implemented. Also, since, since we are a security, uh, uh, aware industry, we also uh, hire some world-class security experts and cryptographers, and which help us actually counterattack the the threats that come to the security of the card and its owner. So that brings us to smart card, the communication protocol. So actually, I, I forgot to mention in the first slide, everything about smart card is mostly standardized in ISO. There is a standard called ISO 7816, which talks about what are the mechanical, physical, electrical characteristics of a smart card chip. So it's a pretty standard device. And in the same spirit, the communication protocol that is used by smart cards is also standardized. And it is defined in chapter 3 of 7816. The card, so the card does not have a power of its own. It does not have a battery. So it typically acts in a master-slave combination where card is a slave and the host portion supplies power and sends some command to it and smart card respond to that particular command. It's a synchronous protocol. And the interesting thing here is that the protocol, the communication protocol that is used to communicate with smart cards also overloads as an application protocol. Essentially, transport protocol and application protocol, there is a very thin line between them. And there is some history, some legacy reasons behind them. And foremost, I think, is because of the resource constrained nature of the device. So here is a, a picture which is showing how, how this flow happens from a transport protocol perspective. 
there is an application which sent command to a reader. I'll talk about what reader is later on. Through the reader, it reaches the card, and card has a software processor where it maps that command to a particular function. So, these are, so smart cards actually have various facets, various forms, and these are few of them. The most famous is the SIM card, and actually everybody in this room, I'm pretty sure, that has a mobile phone, and mobile phones also use smart cards, which are called SIM cards. And SIM is actually the backbone of GSM industry in the sense that it is the piece which, which authenticate you and your mobile equipment to the operator's network. And it also plays a major role in the, uh, it also plays a, a very major role in, in doing what we call roaming. Then there is a credit card form factor, which, you know, again, we are familiar with. In U United States, though, when banks issue cred a credit card or a debit card, it is mostly a magnetic strip card. But in most of the European countries, it is mandated by banks to have a smart chip cards. Then, then there is an, another interesting format, which is a format of USB tokens, like you see mass, mo mass memory tokens. The difference here is that this time, instead of you know, carrying a separate reader in which you insert the card, the reader and the card are together in form of a USB token. And finally, this is a latest new form factor. If you get a US passport these days, smart card chip is embedded in the cover of the passport, so that when you pass through customs line, you and it's actually a contactless smart card, so that you can wave it uh, from a distance and your data is read. So a little bit about the business verticals to, to give an idea the segments in which we use smart cards. And actually, when I was gathering some numbers, I was myself very surprised to see we actually, the smart card industry, has manufactured in 2007 alone 3.5 billion smart cards, which is like 3.5 billion operating system software that goes with these tiny computers. And, and here, you know, there are four areas. The first, the top left is governments use smart cards for e-passports, even to give the cards to citizens to authenticate. For example, DOD also uses it here. Corporations, enterprises use it. Financial institution banking, very famous in, in European countries. And the last and the most important, the place where you know a lot of smart cards are used every year is in the GSM industry network with network operators. So what I'm going to do to have a focus in this presentation is that I'm going to concentrate on, on these three form factors, these three segments. And although all of this scales to same, but in order to have a focus, I'm just going to talk more about how smart cards play a role in desk desktop infrastructure, and then we'll see how, how they could you know, have a role to play in the security of web applications. So as I talked about infrastructure, and I had mentioned earlier that smart cards, they do not have a power of their own. They do not have sort of a battery. So in order to draw power, they need to be inserted in a device which is called a smart card reader, which is further connected to the PC, mostly nowadays via USB interface. And, and because it's a device, you need a driver. And that driver is actually a standard USB class called CCID, and it's part of all the operating system today. So in that sense, readers provide you a plug and play sort of an experience. On top of the reader uh, layer, reader driver layer is another layer which provides an abstraction API so that you could write client applications not knowing which reader you are talking to or which smart card you are talking to, and that's essentially called a PCSC. The PCSC is, stands for uh, Personal Computer Smart Card. It's basically a group that was formed by operating system manufacturers, Apple, Microsoft, and uh, smart card reader manufacturers like you know us. So, so the application sits on top of the PCSC layer, and it communicates via this interface to the card. Little bit, little bit about the history of smart cards. The first commercialization of smart chip cards actually occurred in 1983 in France to be used for, uh, for, for, uh, for, for pay phones. The, 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 the idea was that you could store some points in the card 
and you do not need any backend infrastructure or spend you know, money using your credit card form factor. So as you talk, your money is getting deducted from the pay card. 1991, as I talked about, SIM card uh, is the backbone of GSM industry. In 1991, they were created. 1992 saw the commercial debit card in, in France, which is called Carte Bleu. And it's a de facto standard these days there. And now, from, from programmers, from an application perspective, we'll talk about two major events that happened in smart card history. And they are Java card invention and a .NET card innovation. So starting with, with Java card, which I call a revolution, in the sense that, that, that we took Java to some unknown territories, to some unimaginable form factor. Imagine running a Java in a device which has memory of few KBs, a CPU which is 8 to 16 bits. So in that sense, it was really revolutionary because it was not even imagined, even by the creators of Java, that it could run in such a form factor. And here, I'll, actually, I would like to also quote a very famous quote from ex-chairman of Sun Microsystems, Scott McNeely, who once said that, that putting Java in a smart card is something like playing golf in a telephone booth. So, so let's see what is so revolutionary about this smart card. First and foremost, the notion of programmable smart card. Earlier, you know, we, the smart card manufacturers, will write an operating system, write an application, send it to the market. Now, because you could program this card in a managed language, in a virtual machine-based language, we just need to prepare an operating system, maybe built in some libraries, and it's the third party which actually create applications. So it actually created some business opportunity, and we believe that the openness of the platform also helps there in the sense that some other people could innovate. So, so the APIs, the, the way you program, it is all standard, again, uh, through Sun Microsystem. There is a Java card specification if you visit Sun Microsystem website. And this brings us to a very, very important event, very important thing uh, regarding Java card was that Java, when Java was created, it, it, it had a mantra that try once and run anywhere. So with, for Java card, we, we took the spirit of that mantra in the sense that, that, that we, we, we use Java the language, Java platform, the compiler to generate an executable, which is ZAR file uh, for Java systems. And then we run a tool called converter to generate an executable which ideally suits the environment that smart cards provide. And this sort of pragmatism is still applied today. And, and actually, two notable Google open source projects, one is GWT, Google Web Toolkit, which uses Java to compile the program into JavaScript. And then there is a new one, which is called Android, which also uses Java, the language, compiler, tools, but it generates a different format of executable than the ZAR file. So some points about how, how it is different from the Java that runs on the PC, both from Java card virtual machine and runtime. It actually implements a subset of Java language in terms of types. Not all types are supported. There are some specialized byte codes in order to handle the, the stack implementation, the interpreter stack that, that we have. And there is a special treatment of static fields in the sense that the Java virtual machine in a smart card it never terminates and always execute on a single thread. So on PC, when you program, you start a program, it starts a virtual machine, and you have a program running. You start another program, it runs in its own virtual machine, and the staticness of the types are different. But here, we need to do something special so that we can still maintain the integrity sanity of static fields of a program. Moving on to the runtime portion, the, this is where you, know, you see the biggest difference between the application running on PC and smart card is that the memory management that we have is different from what happens on PC. On PC, you start a program. It creates objects in RAM. Program terminates. Objects die. But the, most of the applications for smart cards, you need, to re, you need to store a state. For example, if you are using a credit card, debit card type application, you need to do increment, decrement, and still save the state when the smart card is plugged in. So what we follow is a persistent memory model, 
which means that we create objects in EEP ROM, where they do not get removed if you remove the power. And another actually important thing here is uh, transaction management. So like in databases, when, when you interact with databases, send something to be updated or deleted, you want everything to happen under a transaction. Similar thing applies here, but in a small form factor and a little bit more complex, is that, that because smart cards can be taken out from the reader at any point of time, that is, their power can be taken out at any point, you want to make sure that the logic, the block, the block of code that you are running, if it is updating some, some fields, objects, either they are updated, or if your logic has not finished, things will be rolled back. So we do handle this you know, uh, correctly, and this, some, some, this is one of the difficult areas to get it right in such a resource constraint device. And then because Java happened for smart cards, there's a possibility of writing applications. So a, a bank can write an application, an airline guy can write an application, and they can coexist in the smart card. So sometimes they want to share data, sometimes they do not want to share data. So there is some protection, some, some help that the framework provides, which is not there in Java that when it runs on PC, and it's called firewall. This is a toy Java card application, just to give you a hint of how these applications look like. So the application in, a Java, in, in Java card, it's called an applet. So there are some methods that, that I'll ignore just for a minute. So the method of interest is, here is this process method, which is an entry point for the command. So if you remember my earlier slide where I said that, that in, in, in smart cards there is a software called APDU Dispatcher, which takes a command and invokes appropriate functions. So here that dispatcher is implemented in Java, where this process method receives the APDU. Java card provides a type, typed interface to the protocol. And then it dispatches or it invokes appropriate method depending on what it sees, what the logic of a program sees in the input. So, so Java card is really a revolutionary technology. It did real great things for smart card industry. It showed where you can run Java. But like any other technology, it, we do, did have some misses, some limitations. And, and the two that stand out for me are, first of all, that it, it, it provided a shim on the communication layer, but it never really tried to abstract the, the transport and an application protocol differences. And with, with experience, we have seen that it is really important because once a programmer start to play or start to learn about these, it makes his life difficult and lead to a lot of error prone situations. We want developers, programmers to rather concentrate on the business logic that they are putting in the application than dealing with the transport protocol. So I, I feel that this is where you know, Java card had a miss. So second is that, so there is a persistent memory, persistent store in the card, but, but there, are, there are many times need arise in market that you put an application in the card and you want to update it, I mean the code of it. So because the objects are still live, you cannot remove the application because objects have a reference, has a dependency on the type itself. So in order to update application or add new feature to it, you would essentially delete the, the, in all the objects belonging to it and then delete the application and reload it. So this was one of the problem, and it arise mostly because we didn't have an alternative store in the card. So these, so, so Java card had some misses, and you know whenever there is a problem, it leaves a ro room to do some new innovation, to leverage on a new opportunity, and that's what .NET Smart Card did, which I call an innovation. It we learned a lot from our Java card experiences and implemented in a in a .NET smart card, which also addresses you know, uh, developers who are used to program in .NET Microsoft technologies. So let's see what is so evolutionary about this smart card. So from the get-go, it tried to first eliminate the problems that, that were there in Java card. So it abstracted the communication protocol. It uses a remoting infrastructure provided with .NET so that you treat the object in a smart card, like a remote object, and you just invoke a method on it. You do not need to know anything about the transport, 
or a communication protocol. Also, it provided a native file system accessible via API so that if you want to, to store your data in a file by doing serialization, now you could do that. And the third and actually the most important point here was that with .NET came some new things, such as notion of metadata. And this actually helped us in the, in the smart card in order to implement transaction security and some legacy support thing in a, in, a, in a much better way because we could now associate that as a metadata to the application. And then there are some more things which happened when we were on this ride of doing .NET smart card. We tried to even push the boundaries and put you know, some sort of XML parsing in the smart card pushing the boundaries, basically trying to experiment with how far we can go in a small form factor and how, how much we can get out of it. It has a richer type support. It supports strings, collections, hash tables. For, for you know, people on PC, it's you know, evident, so what's new, but fitting it in, in you know, few KB of RAM and few KB of EEPROM, it's really challenging. Same application for .NET Smart Card looks like this which is very much how you program on PC. You just need to compile it against write libraries and put it in the card, and it works. So, so now we are at a very interesting you know, turn in the journey, which is talking about applications. So these are actually not the applications, but the categories of applications that smart card have. These are very broad categories. Authentication, it's an authentication device. Cryptography to do digital signature and encryption. It has a secure storage so that if you have some sensitive material, you could essentially put it in the smart card. And all of, and you can apply some sort of a policy management on all of this. So now smart cards have authentication as well as, as, well as authorization. And there is one application which I personally use very much in days of January and February in Austin is to scratch the eyes from the windshield because there is a black eyes in, in Austin in January. So, you can at least use it, use this feature. So, 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 so I talk mostly about you know, what smart cards are, what is the infrastructure in which they fit in, the reader's infrastructure, and now it's a time to see if some application wants to leverage a smart card functionality, how it does. So, so in the previous slide, I, I, I said a lot of cryptography goes in the card. And, and it made sense to look into what is the cryptographic support provided by operating systems. And we figured that operating systems typically have an architecture where they try to abstract it. And they try to, to have an architecture such that anybody, any third party or a vendor could implement a cryptographic service. service. And they also provide some crypto, cryptography by, by their own. But the thing is that it is not universal across all the operating systems. Microsoft uses something called CAPI, it's a Microsoft specification. Mac OS X uses CDSA, and PKCS 11 is an open RSA standard whose implementations are there on all PC, but it is not native to either operating system. These are the applications of, these are the example of applications which uses these specifications slash standards to leverage cryptographic services. I have this, this guy in, in big font, big bold, because that's actually really the topic of our interest, and I'm going to talk more about that later. So a quick recap. Smart card goes in a reader. Reader has a driver inbuilt in OS. It is used by PCSC, the abstraction layer. And now there is one more thing here, which we call middleware. Middleware essentially is an implementation of the CAPI interface or a CDSA interface or a PKCS 11 interface which communicates with smart card to leverage its security capabilities. So again, a, a, you know, a very dramatic twist in the journey. So let's enter the web. And before you know, I, I, I explain how it wo all works in web and how all of this scale, I just want to emphasize on a very important aspect of web which all of us know here it's the ubiquity. Web application runs irrespective of the browser OS combination that it is rendered in. And that's really a key for the success of internet and the World Wide Web. So 
Here is a slide where I'm, I'm trying to show how smart cards work in this ecosystem. If you want to leverage the smart card cryptography, cryptographic services from Internet Explorer, what you need on the host machine is a CSP implementation, essentially a CSP-based middleware. If you want to go through Firefox, you require PKCS 11-based middleware. And if you are using Safari, you need a card-specific token D. And if you want to, if you are on a server side, if you are programming a web application on a server side, you need to also be aware of how your application will be rendered in a respective browser, because browsers expose different cryptographic interfaces. Which, for me, is a very nice way of saying that you know, if you want to use smart cards for web applications, why not break the ubiquity of the web and lose the mobility of smart cards? Because in order to utilize the cryptographic aspect of a smart card, you need to have this middleware piece on the host machine. And, and even worse, you need to have it for all the browser operating system combination. So, so smart cards, other than security, they also have one more value, which is mobility of your credentials. So if you're using a smart card and you, you move to another PC, you need to have that middleware installed on that machine. So is it really mobile? And, and there is one more thing. This is a very famous uh, principle of psychological acceptability, mostly pointing out at the usability aspect of security mechanisms. And in brief, it says that the security mechanisms should not be harder than, should not come into a way of a user. If they were accessing a resource in a certain way, and you, you come and you say, you know, this thing is going to make your life easy, or rather more secure, it shouldn't you know, make it harder. But if we look at this, this middleware and a smart card combination, it is actually making it harder. Plus, the support that is provided through the browsers is not that nice either. And I'm going to show you how, what I'm talking about uh, when it comes to usability. So I'm at a website where, where I'm going to log on using a smart card certificate. I have my smart card already inserted. It's basically a recorded demo. And, and I also have the middleware piece installed on my machine. So the harder part is still taken care of. I'm just showing how what is the user experience in this ecosystem. So I go ahead and I uh, press on certificate login. And it presents me a choice to select a certificate. Because everything in crypto architecture, it is agnostic to you know, which device you are talking to, or you're talking to a software cryptographic service provider. It, lets you, it asks you the certificate which you want to use to authenticate. So first point of you know, bad user experience, who the hell knows what certificate is? You and me may know, because we are you know, technology people. But for an end user, it is really hard to figure out what is going on. And then I select a certificate. I still have my smart card inserted, which has this certificate. And the middleware prompts you up, prompts you to enter the pin so that you could you could ask your card to do the signature operation. So I'm going to enter actually a wrong pin here, just to show what happens. So I entered a wrong pin, and the middleware correctly told me that you have some number of tries remaining. The, the, the thing that, I try to, that I'm trying to show is that this user interface is not consistent, because every middleware will have a different interface. Yes, sir? How do you know you're talking to the middleware, period? Because be anybody asking for your pin, right? So this actually dialogue is, is coming out from a middleware. How do I know? Yeah, you, you do not have a way of knowing it. So I'm going to enter a pin, and then, then I'm going to press a cancel. 
And what happens is that, see, it's a web application. And it didn't have a way of updating its UI to say that you know something wrong happened, you, you know, canceled it. And ultimately, it's a bad user experience. That's how typically smart cards and browsers behave. And I'm showing it with Internet Explorer. It is true with Safari or Firefox, which have, again, different way of presenting how you authenticate. So moving on to a very interesting thing that has happened to us, which is Web 2.0. Uh, Google is you know, a big, huge web company. And in some ways, they brought this revolution of Web 2.0 to the industry. And Web 2.0 means a lot of things to a lot of people. It means social networking, great user experience, maps, it also comes with some issues like phishing and theft because more and more people are going online. The, the thing, actually, when I was looking at it, the thing that really interested me and which I believe is, is, is the thing which really created all of this, or at least you know, it, 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 it was a bootstrapper for a lot of things to happen. And that's an object in a browser called XML HTTP request, which lets JavaScript in a page, communicate with the server in a browser and an browser and operating system agnostic way. It was done in 1999 in IE, and now all the browsers have. And typically, when I'm giving you know such a kind of talk, I go and explain you know what is the problem that it is solving. But I hope I don't have to do here because you guys you know know web better than most of the people in the world. So it's a very famous quote from Isaac Newton. And so, you know, looking at this XML HTTP request, Ajax, I got inspired, and it made me think that the device that I play with, I use, I program, I build systems, it's a very standard device. It has, it has a mechanical electrical characteristics specified by ISO. Its communication protocol is standard. It's even the Java card specification is a standard in some sense. It is from Sun Microsystem, followed by a large community. And if I want to use it for web, I have to you know, go through all this cryptographic architecture, which, first of all, require a lot of peace on the computer and doesn't give me better usability. And this made me think that what we really miss if we want to enable the security of smart cards for web applications is just a connectivity bridge which could use the same communication protocol as specified by ISO to communicate with any smart card. So very much like XML HTTP request, but this object, instead of communicating to a server, it communicates to the smart card connected to the machine. <laughs> These are some characteristics of uh, this uh, Actually, it's a browser extension. We have done it for all the operating systems, browser combinations. It's, it also provides a toolkit to do smart card aware web application. It's very lightweight. It installs very quickly. And the most important thing about it is it is free for use. It is for the industry. It, there, is, there is no vendor specific pitch here. It is to make the smart card usable to provide the security for web applications. Basically, again, you innovate on top of it as it has been done for XML HTTP requests in the past. Few lines of JavaScript to show you know, how all of this works. So it's a very you know, simple, the most simplest HTML page that one could write. And, and, and actually, this also you know, reminded me of one more thing that, that I, I wanted to mention here. We talked a lot about cryptography in our uh, last slides. There's one more thing. Smart cards also have some other features, like authentication. So there is a cryptographic-based authentication, and you could have some custom authentication mechanism built into it. And the, one of the example is to generate one-time passwords. Crypto stacks do not provide a way to get one-time passwords out of the smart card. 
And this application, because now you could communicate with Smart Card directly through the JavaScript, it provides you a way to do so. So, there is, so you include a script, a wrapper script, which hides all the browser-specific differences. You press a button which invokes this get OTP method, instantiate that object from a library. You try to find which reader it is connected to. And uh, connect to that reader, exchange a command, get a response, and you have the one-time password. Very simple. Uh, what I'm not showing you here is that it also, the, the object also provide you a facility so that you could, you know, uh, have insertion and removal of a smart card in a reader. You could detect it from your application, unlike you know the crypto stack. So the same application because we did talk about .NET card, which so here you see you know some commands which looks very alien to you know the people who program on PC. The same application, the same JavaScript application, if it is communicating with a smart card, looks like this. When the smart card at the other end is a .NET smart card. So, because we have a remoting infrastructure and JavaScript does not provide that infrastructure, we implemented the engine to marshal a method call and get a response back purely in script. And what you get is some, a code like that. You create a proxy object and invoke a remote method on it. So, simple and elegant. So, what I'm going to demonstrate you now is, uh, you know, uh, demo application that we built to showcase the power of power of S connect and this application is nothing but a device administration service this is something else also which cryptographic stack does not provide because you have a device you want to change its pin you have blocked it or you want to load certificates this is not possible via the cryptographic stack so i'm going to show you a demo which essentially illustrate that and the user experience that you get with S Connect. And in the demo, I'm also going to show you how easy it is to install if it is not present on your machine. So the smart card that I'm using is a .NET smart card. And these are essentially some functions, changing pin, unblocking pin. So here, the, this, web, this browser did not have S-Connect installed. So the website is, able, website is able to detect it and you know, prompt you for the installation. So now, logic to, I'm, I'm just pausing here, logic to detect whether the smart card was present or not, or if the smart card is inserted, happens now at a page level. So I inserted the card, it is reading it, and then you're providing a UI to, to interact with it. So a lot of JavaScript code happens behind the scenes. You could look at you know, the characteristics of a card. So all of this you do not get via the cryptographic stack. So how, how are you communicating with the, with the card reader and the card? So, so, so the S-Connect extension basically uh, is a wrapper over the PCSC layer, which further communicates with the reader and the card. So basically I made just the, the PCSC layer scriptable through an extension for all the browsers. So does it need to be signed or something with JavaScript or? So, so it's a very interesting question. So, so JavaScript signing is, yeah. signing is not supported by Internet Explorer. And even in Firefox, to sign JavaScript, it's a little hard. But here, the, 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 the combination is very interesting. So how do you trust? So the question asked was that, does JavaScript need to be signed uh, for to interact with the card, and the answer is that not all the browsers support JavaScript signing, and even the browsers that they support, Firefox and Netscape, the, the workflow is very hard to achieve. 
But interesting here, interesting thing here is that you are communicating with the smart card device, and most of the time, smart card device first asks the client, which is communicating to it, to authenticate. So it, it is happening behind the scene here. So it would not speak to just any any website. That website needs to know the same sort of a key material, some sort of a information which the card trusts. And here, this is a, uh, a just a sample uh, site. So, so we are just using the admin key, all zeros here. But in, in real life, you get on a phone, and the other guy also has a smart card. Admin has a smart card, and this is what it used to unblock the card. So this was a very simple device administration website. And now I'm going to show you a more concrete example where you would see that the two-factor authentication provided by smart card is used. I never actually spoke anything about two-factor. So smart card, what they bring is what we call two-factor authentication, because smart card is a device that you have. PIN is something that you know. So it's a two factors. It's two factors that you need to get in to a system. So what I have is a, a fictitious you know, company, which I call Mahuna. And what it is, it, it's a very identity savvy company, identity and security savvy company, which believes in cloud computing. It even uses Google Apps to do its office management. But the thing is that it's a security savvy company, and it has to be compliant with some standards. And in order to do that, it needs to use stronger form of an authentication to let the user in. Stronger form of authentication to us translates into a smart card authentication, essentially. And, and in order to do that, so this company distributes smart cards to its employees. And because it's very identity savvy company, when a user registers, it also gets an open ID. So what I'm going to show you in this demo is that how we enable the two-factor authentication for Google Apps as well as you could use your smart card, same credentials to log in into any OpenID enabled website. OpenID is another standard out there to, to do single sign-on, essentially. Google Apps uses SAML specification. So what I'm showing here is just a simple registration at, at a Mohuna site, it is again you know, using S-Connect technology to communicate with the smart card. So Mohuna supports different type of smart cards. So when you insert it, it determines whether your smart card is supported or not. You enter a PIN. And at this point, just to emphasize on when you said that, how do you know that it is talking to my smart card, right? Here, the mutual authentication is happening. The website really knows that it's a smart card at the other end, because before, before, before smart card could do anything, the website has to authenticate, and a smart card has to authenticate to the server. So we are registering a user which is called Jay Walker, and it's basically you know my my work area playground to you know experiment with technology, so the website doesn't look that nice. So now this user is registered, and what he's doing is creating some sort of personas so that he can use different identities at different websites. And all these identities, attributes, they are getting stored in a smart card also. So 
the so user is provisioned, but he is not creating some attributes about himself because he is going to use it with you know some any open ID relying party, and he may not want to give you know credentials that he use at work. These are uh, what we call personas, avatars that he is storing in the smart card. So he is creating a office avatar, you know, where he will give his office email. They are getting saved in the smart card. The question was that where are these attributes getting stored in? And the answer is that uh, they are going in the smart card. So simple registration of a user, creation of identities in the, in the smart card. So now we have the identities in the card. Now we are going to any uh, open ID enabled relying party. For example, the site that I picked randomly is uh, jide.com. And it requires that you sign in with open ID instead of creating a username, password account again. So you press this, you specify your open ID identity, which you get once you registered with the Mehuna. So it's mehuna.com slash jwalker. This website has a protection of bot bouncer, so it's going to take a little bit of time because it wants you to tell that you are a valid, because you are going there for the first time. No, it's just, uh, just to prevent some attack uh, from crawlers, some automatic programs. And since at this time, Jait has contacted through its backend to Mehuna and redirected you to a page where Mehuna is asking, do you allow this website to access your uh, attributes? So I didn't need to enter the pin because I had already entered the pin. And this website not only required an authentication, but, but in order to provide a better user experience, it also required some attributes of the user. So at this point, he's going to choose the attributes that, 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 that he wants to be transferred. And they are coming again from the card, from the smart card. So he's going to choose his home persona, home avatar, where his email is john at walker.com. And you will see that now he's logged, logged in at OpenID relying party using a single sign on using OpenID protocol. And we'll also see that some other attributes of his, like his name, full name, email, were also transferred because he made a choice to, to be sent to the relying party. So it's single sign on here. So enough of roaming around. So now he wants to do some work. And he wants to basically access his Google Apps, documents, email. And because Mehuna, the fictitious company, requires stronger authentication, you would see that because Google Apps uses SAML protocol to do single sign-on, and I have a setup, I have purchased few accounts from Google to enable such a kind of scenario. He would go and so here I'm basically showing some uh, some things which are offered by Google Apps. Not interesting to you, but you know people I show generally like them. So now we are signing in. So this is the interface which Google provides so that a user could specify its uh, domain name and the type of service that it wants to access. So as soon as you click go, now Google Apps communicate with Mehuna so that Mehuna could authenticate the user, again, using two-factor. Here, very much like OpenID, but in the back end, the protocols are different. You are using the smart card. 
to authenticate to Mehuna, and Mehuna is sending a signed summarization to Google saying that this particular user is a good guy. He has authenticated to me using stronger form of authentication. Please sign him in. So because I have limited accounts, I'm mapping John Walker to a demo account that I have called smartguy at mahuna.com. And see here now, he could access his docs using a stronger form of authentication. So single sign-on coupled with great user experience, no middleware, it works on Mac OS X, Firefox, Mac OS X, Linux, Internet Explorer without needing any host component. Other than, of course, S-Connect, which we call Zero Plus install because of its lightweightness. And we feel that if it is part of browsers, next generation browsers, it, 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 seem, it would enable the seamless integration of smart cards in the world of web. So this brings me to the end of this journey. And I hope I, would, I was able to you know, communicate how easy it would be to use the smart cut security for web applications if we have this browser agnostic connectivity bridge. And if there is any more question, I'm. Yeah. I have a question. So in one of your very first slides <coughs> where you showed how many smart cards are being produced and where they're all being deployed. Yeah. You focused on the 20 million part, which was insignificant to compare to No, the actually I focused on, let, let me go back. I focused on three parts. <coughs> I mean, basically what I'm saying is it would be yeah. much more sense to uh, well, have an S connect that talks to your mobile phone, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's my question as well, uh, which is, why would I carry a smart card when I already have a mobile phone? Uh, because you still have computers and you access internet via computer, you do a lot of cloud computing using your machine, and you want to have a strong authentication implemented for that that computing machine also. True, but what I'm saying is, can the reader not be coupled with your cell phone as opposed to carrying? It, it is in some sense. So you have a SIM card. So all of this, as I said earlier, we are trying to scale also that in the in the mobile form factor. So. So the, the numbers are actually not just 20 million, it is 300 plus 20 plus 500 million. So I was talking about all three of them, which uses the desktop infrastructure. But these techniques also scale. But these techniques also scale to, sim, so to GSM, which is going to be our next focus to simplify the life. All the, uh, so GSM, the, the phones present a different type of challenge because you know there are variations of operating systems and browsers there. And so we are going to work there, and I'm actually looking forward to see how Android, the Google open platform for mobile equipment, is going to help us there. Because you could use the, the phone essentially through the ISP as have it talk to the... Yeah, yeah. so, so we, have, we have done some experimentation there, basically accessing the phone. Uh, there's a phone called NFC phone, NFC-based phones. So you could you know, connect them through your PC and still leverage the SIM card that is in your... Uh, mobile phone or, or via Bluetooth. So can you elaborate a bit on how the smart card authenticates who's asking? So like who, who is it talking to? Which site is it talking to? How does it, the smart card get cryptographically convinced that it's talking to a legit party? Question. So the question is that how does smart card know that it is talking to a legitimate party? to a right party, right? Yes. So, so let's, let's say that if you have a smart card application, you build a custom application, and you put in there some public certificates of some websites, right? You go to, you insert your card, and then this website, what it does is that it, smart card gives a random number, this, website and its backend essentially encrypt that with the private key. In some sense, sign it. Once this goes to the card, the card could use the public portion of the key pair to verify whether the site that it is communicating to is a legitimate site or not. And most importantly, it also generates a session key. And all the communication that happens is encrypted via this session key. 
essentially the smart card does an SSL connect to the server. That's, that's, that's right. is true so so that's why we that's why we had the consent dialog so that so there is some help that we are getting from the user that before a website could interact with the card he provides a consent sort of added to its whitelist and because there is this this secure communication channel even though malware is coming sending something to a card, the card is not going to reply back with you know, right credentials or it will not sign your stuff until the client application has proven that it's a, it's a good application. So malware will not have the same key material as the, the server on the back end would have. Essentially, you know, the same answer that I was giving you earlier, to protect against malware, we mostly rely that, that the client application also authenticate to the card before card could release its resources. Sure, but like malware on my computer would use my smart card to log in as me anywhere without me being. No, it can't because malware has to authenticate to the card. Like, you assume the trusted UI where I enter my PIN is not compromised by the malware. I assume it is. So the malware knows my PIN. So, yeah, but, but it's not just the PIN. PIN is for you, the user, to authenticate to the smart card. Yes. But there is one more form of authentication that you have to also build in, which is that the application, the software that is communicating with the card has also to, should also prove that it's a right software. Using the, again, public uh, key cryptography. Yes, but they can walk me in as me without me having to right. So no, they can't. Like, I, I don't see how they could, like, if my machine has malware on it, this card doesn't. It's, it's basically an oracle at their disposal. They can log into any site that my card uh, feels like talking to. Yeah, I think if you have that kind of malware, you are your host. Well, it would be nice if the smart card would sort of help you there. But it, I mean, it helps, it helps in the sense that you, can, you have to authenticate to that software. That Card and the software has to authenticate, but if the malware is so smart that it can even conduct that authentication, uh, you uh, you gotta hurt your machine and change it. Sure, but at that point the question comes up like, uh, why smart card? Why not just rely on the OS to hide a private key for me? Well, you know, it is security is about different kinds of locks, right? So it's sure. a whole spectrum. So you can have nothing, or you can have the bulletproof thing that never lets you in, or you can have maybe something right. in between. So that's yeah. the kind of spectrum of trade-off. Where? Asking for people to, you know, sure, take a big hurdle here. It better buy us something. I'm yeah. not convinced it buys as much in that respect. Um, other Any questions? other questions? Yeah. So the the Java card thing or the .NET card thing is very interesting. I go to Fry's. I can't buy one. Like, what's up? Buy from our website. So. So. If you yes, mostly. For something like this, say, oh, manage your open ID. It, it is happening. It is happening now. So there will be card. cards. There will be cards that will. So Java card and .NET card come with their respective SDKs. You can buy them from the web store of the companies. Yeah. The end user card, if you're talking about to use it for yourself, they will be, you know, available in Walmart in form of USB tokens. You know, when I said Walmart, you know, all the retail shops. There will be, but if you want to play with it from a developer's perspective. I mean, that has been the state for the last 18 years, right? You can buy developer kits from anybody. Uh, end users can't get cars. No, end users are typically, today they are getting from their corporations, from enterprises. But if you want to push it to the web, you need to. Yeah, yeah and definitely, that's what, definitely need to work on that aspect. You need to get over that hurdle, because like, if I can't pick them up from price, like, why would I use it? We, we are manufacturing actually a USB token combination which has you know a lot of mass memory also so that you do not have to carry tokens, multiple tokens, one just for security and one for mass storage. So that kind of token will soon be available in the market for end users. And the, 
will be open in the sense that I can program my own app. If you, you buy, you buy an SDK. No, so you buy, yeah, you buy an SDK, and you download your own application in the card. Provided, as, okay, as you said, you know, can I load new application in a card? That depends. That depends on the policy of the smart card. So that's why you know our industry distinguishes between you know developer smart card and a end user card. So you purchase a developer card, experiment with it, you know, build a new stuff. I mean that's a very critical point to address, right? Like either it's open and the card acts on behalf of the user. It's like I make up a private key, I stick it in this card. It's my oracle, and like I write the application, or I buy a card from somebody. They tell me what it can do, and now everybody has to. And, yeah, and I think we are we are starting to look at those models, and I think technologies like this, especially when you go on the web, will help. You know, when, when, when you can actually, because it's also about not only having the device, what it's about also what you can do with it, right? Right. And so, uh, I mean, you're right though. For for a long time, the promise has been there, and it has never quite made it. Right? But but you know, we live on hope, right? Like the rest of us. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. And um, uh, if you have any other uh, kind of questions about, uh, you know, uh, feedback on the video, etc., we can try to set that up. Right? Thank thanks. you.